live from the campaign loop of the European Green Party in Brussels. This is the final online Green presidential primary debate. Four candidates are contesting to become the Green leading candidates. The two winners will engage in debate with leaders of other political families and be our candidates for president of the European Commission. For the first time in European history, these candidates will be elected in an open election. Every European citizen of above 16 may vote. In 24 hours from now, the voting will close. So this is your last uh, opportunity to uh, make your choice. And I was hearing myself. My name is Sir Roger and I will be your moderator for the coming hour. The candidates in this coming hour will present themselves to you and try to convince you that they are the best candidates to make Europeans vote green in the European elections and they are best qualified to lead Europe out of the crisis. This broadcast is divided into four topics. The future of Europe, youth unemployment, clean energy and migration and free movement. Also joining are three civil society organizations who have prepared some questions for our candidates. But also, we would like to invite all the viewers to send your questions on these topics. Behind me, you see a team, and they are collecting your questions from Twitter, Facebook, and email, and putting them on my screen. Let's start the debate and introduce the contenders. Our first contender is uh, EGP co-president Monica Frassoni, who is joining us live from Brussels. Monica, can you hear me? Yes, Please unmute I can yourself. hear you yeah. loud and clear. Good evening. How are you doing? Buonasera. Good. How, uh, uh, this is the, will be the last debate of this campaign. How was it for you to do this campaign? But I must say that I really liked it. Uh, I thought at the beginning it was quite uh, tough to get people to understand what we actually we were doing. But uh, towards the end, in the new year, it took off and uh, I, I enjoyed it really quite a bit. Okay, wonderful. Uh, joining us from Strasbourg, um, German MEP Ska Keller. Ska, Ska, can you hear me? Yes, I hope so. I hope that you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. I heard you were in Strasbourg to discuss with the French Young Greens several topics, uh, among one TTIP, the trade agreement between the EU and the US. Why is that such an important topic? The TTIP, the EU-US trade deal that is currently being negotiated, will completely change the way how politics also function inside the European Union. It will define, for instance, whether GMOs, genetically modified organisms, will be allowed into our food. It will um, decide whether US companies will have the right to sue the EU or member states. So it actually has really big of influence and that's why I'm here also to discuss with the uh, French Young Greens how or what we can do to campaign against TTIP. Is there still something we can do? Excuse me? Is there still something that we can do? Oh yes, of course, the negotiations are still ongoing, they're not at all finished and there's a lot of pressure from civil society and also, of course, from us Greens inside and outside parliaments. And for instance, the Commission has just uh, also acknowledged that there's a lot of protests, for instance, on this uh, companies suing uh, the government's part and they said that they will have a consultation about that before going on with negotiating. Now, of course, okay. this is a very much of a PR coup, but still it shows how much our pressure and our criticisms are being received also and how they arrive at the Commission. Okay, thank you. Also joining us from, uh, I think it's Brussels, Jose Bové. How are you? I'm fine, yes. I'm in my office in Brussels and we had this afternoon uh, an agriculture committee, so discussing about uh, seeds and uh, so this is also a big issue we're going to have also with the TTIP and uh, we have all these debates now and we see that things are getting tougher and tougher since we're getting closer from the elections at the European level. Uh, at the previous debate where I met you in Britain, you were going to an anti-fracking demonstration. Um, how was it for a French MEP to help the British people? Were you appreciated? Well, uh, I think that people were quite happy to see me and we made a, a an interesting debate in the morning in Belcom, which is in the Sussex, and we had this debate with all uh, activists coming from all over uh, UK. And after that, of course, we made a demonstration directly in the field and we were able to occupy uh, the company's place. So uh, 
very the people were very happy to see that at the European level people were able to come and to gather from a lot of countries and to mobilize them there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, third of uh, Ford would be joining us from uh, the German MEP Rebecca Harms. She is on her way to Kiev right now uh, for the demonstrations in Kiev. However, uh, she is expected to join us any second from now. Uh, as soon as she joins, I will ask her to introduce herself. Um, so far, we are just going to start this debate and hope she joins uh, as soon as possible. The first topic we would like to talk about is um, the future of Europe. And please be reminded, uh, if you have any questions uh, for the, one of the candidates, please send them to our Facebook, uh, Twitter, or on email, and we will post them to the candidates. The first topic, as I said, is the future of Europe. And the first question uh, for that, I would like to go to Peter from the Young European Federalists. Peter. Yeah, thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, as Young European Federalists, our organization wants to see a real European federation in the future, with a real European government that is accountable to a very strong European Parliament, and that has the fiscal rules, the decision-making power to protect the euro for, uh, from crashing. We also wanted to be able to restrain, ban to restrain banks, and that it has a strong budget to organize real European solidarity. But the big question is, how can we get there? And there are different perspectives. One perspective that has been proposed in the recent past is that a limited number of countries, member states, would already go ahead by forming some kind of vanguard of reform, and that that little, those, that limited number of countries would already form a core Europe within the European Union that those countries are already a federal Europe while the rest of the countries joins later. Now my question to the candidate is, is how do they feel about these proposals? Do they think that the European Union can become a better place in different speeds or do they, do they think that all the EU member states should always move together even if that would actually be much slower? Okay, I would like to pose this question to Jose. Jose, do you believe in Europe of different speeds or should we all move at the same speed? Well, uh, I think that we completely agree as Greens with the fact that we need uh, to have a European federal institution. I think this is clear. We need more Europe to fight against the crisis. So I think this we completely agree. How do we do it now? Of course, the big problem we have in the Council is that on many issues as budget, as social issues, they are taking the decision at the unanimity of all the countries. And this, of course, is very bad, and we saw how it was going on on the budget and on other issues, on taxes, for example, when we wanted to bring the Tobin tax inside of Europe. So it exists in this moment already uh, two, two Europes. We are the 28 countries together, but in the same time, some of the countries are in the Eurozone and have the same money. So if maybe we can be able to take some decisions inside of the Eurozone already. But that means also that we need to have more participation of the Parliament, of the countries, to be able to control also what is doing the European institution. What is important, if we want to build a federal Europe, we need more democracy inside of Europe, and we need that the citizens are able to control what the states are doing, but also what the European Commission is doing. Okay. Um, Ska, do you think that uh, European citizens would follow the Greens in our plans? Because many people want less Europe, and uh, uh, definitely not a Europe as a country. Well, for me, it's not so much about saying only like we want more Europe, we want Europe or I want Europe in those areas where it makes sense and it makes a lot of sense in a lot of areas like fighting the crisis that you won't do as the single member states. You have to have a strong Europe there together and you have to have a big parliamentary control, etc. And I'm also agreeing with like a stronger budget and everything, but I think it really depends not just saying on saying in any case we want more Europe, but where do you want to have more Europe because it makes sense, because it makes sense to take decisions at European level. Now that doesn't, wouldn't be maybe the case in all cases, but in a lot of cases. And we already have an instrument 
for where member states can go together, the enhanced cooperation. But I wouldn't agree with having a closed circle of a specific number of member states, and then it's always those who goes, go ahead and the other ones are left with uh, behind, like, for instance, in this Eurozone parliament, etc. I think it should always be the parliament as a whole that controls those issues. Enhanced cooperation can be very useful, but still it should be under parliamentary control, and it should always be open for the other member states to join. But that always means uh, that means that we always have to wait for countries like the UK or the Czech Republic who, who don't want to do so much. But in enhanced cooperation, you can already go ahead as a group of uh, as a group of member states, and we have that in a couple of areas. But still, it follows a structure that is recognized by everybody. So, but you just have an intergovernmental agreement like we had in the fiscal compact, and then just include some member states and exclude Parliament and others. I don't think that's the way forward. We are together, the European Union, and we should stick to the rules that we have and also apply them if a few of us want to go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Monica, a lot of people asked us on Twitter and Facebook, should we keep the euro or should we split the euro or abandon it at all? Thank you. I really would like to answer a little bit to the question that was done before. Uh, well, I believe that we as Greens, frankly, uh, are federalists, certainly, but I also believe that we have to be very clear on what we have to do in order to make the European Union more, more democratic. And there are two things that have to be done very quickly, and that is to get rid of the um, unanimity vote in the moment in which you reform the treaties. And I believe that this question of being uh, going go together or not going go together very much depends on our capacity of creating an initiative which has to start from the European Parliament, which is going in the direction of changing the present treaty and starting again the constitutional, the constitutional debate. Um, and I think that that will be one of the most important tasks of the next, uh, of the next uh, uh, Parliament, because you can choose as a member state to stay out of a more integrated Europe, but there must be a democratic moment in which you choose to do so. And I think that that is what this parliament failed to do in this legislation period, and the next parliament should do. We have to go on on the European uh, project, make it certainly more democratic, but we also have to get to, 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 to bring the people with us. But somebody has to start, and the parliament has to, go to start and uh, talk about changes in the city, and it didn't do it in this legislation. As to the euro, yes, we have to keep it, but uh, of course, um, we have to make sure that the euro is not simply a currency, but it is an instrument together with a different, completely different uh, economic and social policy uh, to make people get out of the crisis they have. I think that for a lot, a lot of people, euro was an end in itself. It is just a currency. I mean, it's, uh, it's nothing else than that. And I believe that if you don't join the, the currency with uh, an economic uh, union, and there again, you need to get rid of unanimity and therefore you need a new constitutional initiative, it's going to be very tough. So I think that we have to put together all these things and that's why we as Greens not only, are not only federalists but also pushing for a different policy. You cannot Yo separate. Okay, thank you. Yo Jose, um, uh, Monica calls for a new, uh, a, a new constitution. Uh, the referenda in France and the Netherlands have shown that many people don't want a constitution. Well, I, I don't think that that was the reason. People were not saying that we refuse a constitution. What they refuse, and in France I was in this debate, it was very clear, they didn't want that in the constitution, the economic rules were be inside of the constitution. They wanted clearly to separate how Europe was working, the rights of the people, and they didn't want that the economic rules be put together with those rights and the institution. So that was really the main reason. The fact that we need a debate, it's clear. We have to go on to push for more Europe. And this is going to be, I think, one of the most important debates. We have to be careful during these elections. A lot of people, the populists, are going to try to transform the election and saying this is not an election uh, only to see how it can go better, but to see are we in favor of Europe or not. This is not the debate. We have to be clear. This is to vote, to decide who are going to be the members of the parliament who want to change the politics 
in the European Union. And also we have to build a very strong movement to be able to go further to build Europe. Okay, thank you. Uh, the final question in this round goes to Miguel from Asia. Hello, good evening. Um, well, my question, since you are running for uh, pr the position of uh, President of the European Commission, what would be your priorities for the first two years of mandate if you are elected in this position of President of the European Commission? Monica, can I move this question to you? Please sorry. Please yourself. Yeah. Yes, I'm so sorry. Well, I would do, I would certainly do uh, one thing which I believe it's, uh, it's extremely important and that is to review completely the, uh, the way in which the budget um, is allocated for what the European Commission can do. I think that there are many things that can be done in order to change the, uh, uh, the way in which the budget is spent and I think that uh, we have to push very much for the Commission to do what it was always supposed to do, to have initiatives and, uh, and the initiatives that are going in the direction that we want them to go. I think that there are uh, lots of things that the Commission can do in a different way and uh, uh, the second one I would do is change, take the, 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 the proposal they did on, uh, on energy and climate and put it directly in the dustbin. So I think that these are the two things that I would, okay. uh, that I would, uh, that I would Thank do. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question uh, from Responsible Vote and I ask uh, to you, Ska, uh, do you think 16-year-olds are informed and mature enough to decide on Europe's top position? Yes, I absolutely think that 16-year-olds are not less informed than 18-year-olds. I mean, if you look and where the line was drawn for voting rights, it's, it's, it's none that is based on any sort of facts. I mean, I was active in politics when I was 13. I knew exactly who was wanted to vote when I was 13. I wasn't allowed. I had to wait until 18. Other, peoples are, other people are not informed when they are 40, but still I would fight for their right to vote because of course as a Green Party we do everything to inform people, to campaign also for ideas, to raise people's awareness, but that's not the only thing that it's about. It's about your personal right as a citizen, as somebody living in the European Union to decide who should represent you and I think especially young people should play a bigger role in that because we also see that since the voting age is much later, then politicians will care less of what young people need and what young people want because they're not part of the, so to say, voting force. And I think this is a big problem and indeed I'm very much in favor of lowering the, lowering the voting age. Okay, Th thank you very much. We move on to our second topic, um, which is about youth unemployment. Um, the first question goes to Miguel from Asia. Miguel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. my question then is, uh, when you have the plans for youth unemployment, are they more general European level plans or do you have a specific plans for each one of the countries, or for each one of the member states? Okay, um, I would like to move this question, we plan to move it to Rebecca, but I'm going to move it instead to Monica. That is actually a wonderful question because I believe that uh, one of the differences that we have uh, as Greens in relation, for example, to the left, is that we believe that uh, the uh, proposals that we do on the Green European and the Green New Deal and on the reconversion of, of European um, economy towards sustainability, um, green technology and all the rest of it, is not only something that is there for uh, the southern European countries or for the Nordic countries. It's really something that is necessary for everywhere. In Germany, for example, the European, the, the Energiewende is not over. It is actually could still go wrong. So I think that we need this kind of debate and this kind of proposal in Germany, as of course as in Italy or in Spain and the other countries. So I do believe that the proposals of the Greens above all to get out of the crisis have the very big virtue of being something that can be adapted to all of Europe because we are a European force, of course. Okay, but uh, shouldn't there be, uh, the, the differences are so big country by country, shouldn't it be like tailored to every country, Jose? Yeah, of course. Yeah, but there, there is, is a... Can I move it to, to Jose? Sorry? Uh, I'm moving this question to Jose. Jose, could you, uh, could you elaborate on this? Well, I think that uh, we need to have a, a plan, a double plan. A European plan has to be very clear and 
uh, that means that we need to have to coordinate work and school and how to build really a capacity for the youngs to be able to have a work after uh, going to school. So this is not only for students, it has to be also on a, uh, how you say this, uh, works uh, in the houses, industry and so on. We need really to build this a, a global education for other use at the European level. But also in each country it has to be uh, also a uh, very specific plan to really go on the youth issue because of course in the future if the youth don't have any work how it's going on now in some countries more than 50 percent of unemployment with the youth it's going to have terrific effects for the for the next year so we need clearly to make a European plan and a national plan okay thank you um, Ska uh, Mike from Belgium is asking the question, uh, shouldn't we change the restrictive, restrictive labor laws? In other words, shouldn't it be easier to fire the, the old people who are occupying jobs and sometimes not being so productive so young people who are willing uh, can take over? Please unmute yourself and we can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, it always takes a double click here. I think we shouldn't forget that young people will be older people as well at some point so it doesn't really help anybody if we just postpone the labor crisis to a later stage but rather we should do something that helps young people to get into a job now but also to enlarge their perspective for the future and that will still give them a good job when they're also getting older and for that I agree that we need to have different solutions at different level but there is a lot that the EU can also do for instance, now we're having the European semester where the Commission will always look in how badly the member states are spending money and will propose cuts here and there. I think they should look much more in how well the member state is doing in uh, providing investments into the future, into green jobs, into jobs in education, in healthcare, etc. So really the jobs that are like, that are going to stay for a longer time and that will give especially young people employment. That's the things that the European level can do and uh, they should, the Commission for instance should not like count it as a, as a deficit procedure if member states take investment into the future. But yes, a lot of things will have to be done at member state level but we need to work together and indeed youth unemployment is really structural things because even in countries where we see less overall employment youth unemployment will still be average, uh, higher than the average unemployment. And we should not accept that we have to help young people because if they're starting with no or very low wages, then this will have an impact on the rest of their working life. Okay, thank you. Uh, Monica, we have a, uh, a lot of youth unemployment. At the same time, Europeans are getting older and older. Should we lower the age where people retire so that more young people can get a job? Or should we make it higher uh, because we're getting older uh, every year. I don't think that you can uh, you can uh, answer in a straight way in this way. I think that greens are actually for uh, the capacity of cho of choosing. Uh, I think that there are some people who are older people who are actually terrified of the idea of getting out of the job of their work when they are 60. Uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of young people who need to enter. In the, uh, in the job market. So I think that the only solution for this is to organize a system, first of all an economy that is able to produce jobs because it is able to find new activities and that is why we go back to the question of the Green New Deal because if you don't have jobs to do then there is no job for, work for old or, or, or young people. But I think that we have to find a structure of our social, uh, social security which takes out, takes, uh, is based on certain rights it is obvious that people cannot work forever, but at the same time they must be able to choose whether to go uh, on retirement or not, and not certainly because they get too little attention. I think that uh, a, 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 an harmonic social security system is based on an economic system that works and also on a, on a very clever migration uh, policy which allows people to come in. Okay, we're coming back to migration a little bit later, but first I would like to move to the topic of clean energy. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in uh, through Twitter and Facebook. Um, um, uh, the first one is, what initiatives do we have to support reduce of carbon emissions? This one is coming from uh, Linnea. Um, Jose, can I ask this question to you? 
Well, I think uh, the first thing we can do already, and this is concrete, and we were talking of this just in the beginning when, when the presentation was going on. In some countries, the governments and the companies want to try to find shell gas. This has been nothing done, never has it been happening in Europe. We can stop it now. So that's why the Greens are asking very clearly to have a moratorium on all the countries until uh, the, the European Commission and the Parliament is able to take a positive opinion on this. This is a concrete way to stop with new emission of, uh, of carbon. But also, in the same time, we need to have a very strong position. That means that we need to have a plan at the European level and in the countries to have a lower produce of CO2 from more than 50 percent, between 50 and 60 percent in 2030. This is really one of the most important things we have to do. And I think in, in this election, we have really to talk of this because the only way to reduce the height of the climate is clearly to change the way we have our energy and that means also to change our industry. And this is completely linked with what Monica was saying with the Green New Deal. Okay, thank you. Um, Ska, some people say shale gas and also that the low prices of coal are a blessing for especially the poor people because now they have to spend less of their income on heating their houses and cooking. Do you, don't you agree? No, because poor people also suffer disproportionately from, for instance, the air pollution that comes through the coal mining, or they suffer from the coal mining um, kicking them out of their houses because they have to make space so that more lignite mining, for instance, can be done. It, poor people suffer most from also the very negative effects uh, of shale gas. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword that we're having there. Cheap, en cheap energy prices, that's not everything. And I, should, I rather think we have to restructure, for instance, how pricing of energy works. At the moment, a lot of times, the more you spend on energy, the more you waste energy, the less you pay. And if you only spend a little, then you're actually paying more, disproportionately more. This is crazy because it's... Um, it disfavors poor people, it disfavors those people who are actually saving energy. And I think as Greens we should take a lot of initiatives on renewable energies, Jose has mentioned that, but also on how to use energy more efficient and also how to save energy. And this I think will help specifically people with a lower income, which is also what I think is important because climate, climate change is very much also a question of justice. Okay, thank you very much. In the meantime, has joined us live from Kiev, <laughs> Rebecca Harms. Rebecca, how are you? So I, I was late and uh, the traffic uh, was, after the late flight, uh, the traffic was awful because the ongoing occupation in the center of city, but uh, now I'm here. What, what are you doing in Kiev? Um, I will, t so this evening I'm going to meet uh, several representatives of the civil society, the Euromaidan movement. Uh, tomorrow I will join a session, an urgency session in the Verkhovna Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. And uh, so from tomorrow late in the afternoon I'm joining an official delegation of the European parliament and we hope uh, that we can have some impact to improve the political situation here in Kiev. How, how could that be done? I mean, what do the people care there? So, um, I think um, in the focus of uh, the fight uh, of the citizens of Ukraine is that this state doesn't function for the better sake of its citizens. So they, they are really fed up here uh, with the corruption and that there is not at all the rule of law given. And uh, Yanukovych uh, is uh, the man uh, who is as a person standing uh, for all the failures of the system, the political system. EU in the same time yeah, is uh, like, um, like the symbol for a better life for the citizens. And uh, how, uh, how, how would your influence work? What could you actually achieve? 
Uh, so uh, I can't predict uh, nothing, yeah. But um, I think um, so. The the Europeans should really not pretend that they are not uh, on one side of the discussion because the EU here is representing the hopes and uh, the objectives the what the people are fighting for. Um, but uh, having said this, uh, I'm sure that the best way to come out of this, uh, all, all these uh, negative developments, uh, people dying even in the streets uh, of uh, Kiev and other cities, to come out of this, um, so they have to come back to the table. I think that uh, Mr. Klitschko and the opposition reader, leaders are right uh, putting the focus on uh, new elections. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I am directly going to move to you uh, a, a question about clean energy, what we were talking about. Uh, Rihat asks on Twitter, 20% um, of renewable energy in Europe in 2020, is that really enough? Should we not show the world that 50% or even more is possible? So, um, 20, the 2020-20 20, 20, 20 targets for 2020, so 20% efficiency renewables and CO2 reductions, so this sounds not only strange, uh, these were political uh, figures and um, yes, uh, there would have been possible more, uh, but uh, the actual de development, so the 2030 targets, even less ambitious than the 2020 targets show we are in a political uh, problem. We are in a political mess. We have in Brussels people who do, don't want the energy transition. And so um, I, uh, in our green figures for 2030, much more is feasible. We have a much more ambitious target for uh, renewable energy. And, uh, and this is very, very important, I listened to the last sentences of uh, SCA already, so the ambitious uh, ener a renewable energy target and the more ambitious climate target is feasible only if we go for energy savings and energy efficiency. The key yeah, for a solution of energy and climate problems is in energy efficiency. Okay, thank you. Um, Miquel, you have a question for, uh, for Jose. And please unmute yourself so we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. So my question would be, like, uh, the example of Spain where uh, wind energy is quite a big uh, share of the energy mix, do you think this can be a spread to other, other countries of Europe? And uh, I know there is some resistance because of the landscape uh, impact or the impact also for migration, but do you think these impacts can be minimized and this success of wind energy can be spread all over Europe? Well, I think uh, what we need clearly is a mix. First, we have to reduce the waste of energy. In our country, in France, for example, 40% of energy is completely waste, and this is sometimes, this is mostly the problem of the houses. The second thing is efficiency, as was saying Rebecca, and the third point is renewable energy. I think we are able in Europe in this moment really to build a more important renewable energy uh, project. That means that we have a lot of capacities with wind and with solar, it depends on the countries, and we can really need a plan, but we have to build this at a European level. This is not only a problem countries by country, but that means that the European Union has to build completely the transition between what we're doing now and a new policy. Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to move to our final topic, which is migration and the free movement of people. Um, Monica, I would like to pose the first question to you. It was posed by One Europe. Um, many Europeans are afraid that immigrants from other EU countries will make use of their national welfare systems, and hence the national welfare systems might collapse. Um, do you think that those countries stronger affected by unemployed immigrants from other EU member states uh, should be covered or should be reimbursed uh, with all the member states together? Well, I think that the first thing to say is that there is no such danger. In this moment, if you make the uh, analysis of how much it is uh, given, it, or it is uh, 
the migrants contribute to uh, the tax uh, national different national tax system is by far by far bigger than what they use in uh, using the social uh, the social system the social welfare and I think that that is a truth that has to be repeated over and over again because it is pure propaganda that then if you repeat it becomes truth actually it is not true so I believe that uh, that's, that's the first thing the second thing is that the migration policy in this moment at European level is concentrated both in terms of resources and in terms of rules uh, on the uh, prevention of illegal migration, on stopping people at the borders and all the rest of it. And I think that the big change that we have to see, and if we are going to be stronger in the parliament, we will be more able to do it, is to shift the priority to uh, deal with legal uh, channels of migration and therefore to organize it better than what it is now. So I believe that, uh, that uh, there is a lot of fact-finding that has to be done. It is not true that they are going to, the, our social welfare system is going to collapse. And yes, it is possible to regulate migration in order not to make it uh, un, I don't know, uh, unbearable. And the history, and we have been having enlargement since 1972, uh, it shows that it has never happened that there was a flood of poor migrants in, uh, in, uh, in member states. Okay, uh, Re Rebecca, uh, someone on Twitter, uh, I'm Modi, she suggested, should we um, uh, homogenize the welfare system amongst the EU states? Should we have like more or less the same minimal income or may, uh, same social welfare system? Um, so we are far away from this. Uh, the, there is not such a thing as the European uh, social welfare state. Uh, the situation is very, very different in between the states, especially from the north to the south and the west to the east. You can uh, see those differences. What we have to achieve yeah, is uh, an ongoing improvement of those social models uh, across Europe and I'm very much in, in favor of um, making um, social targets binding across Europe. So we have, uh, climate, we have binding environmental or uh, climate targets. Why don't we have those social targets? And so with my experience, for example, from Greece during the last years, so there is no social security for those people who lost their jobs after six months. And this is a shame for Europe because so Europe was never the promise for a worse life, but for a better life. And this we have uh, to get back. Uh, Jose, um, um, still many people fear that even though there are some rules that um, in, in some, let's say the rich countries, people get fired and then get replaced by people from Eastern European countries or Southern European countries who work far below minimum wages and basically get exploited. Uh, do the Greens have plans to stop that? Well, I think this also is a, maybe it's a fear from the xenophobe and the nationalists. If we see some example, for example, the Polish people who migrated a lot going to UK these last years. When the situation was getting better at the economic level and social level in Poland, most of these migrants came back to the country. I don't know anyone who wants to live in another place than where he was yes. born and where he lives. So I think it's very, you don't have to say that this is going to happen because it's not true. People clearly, maybe at one moment of their life they can change to some country and after, if they have the capacity and the country is building, is getting built better, they can come back. And this is, I think, what has to be the role of Europe to build really a social uh, capacity for each people to be able to live in his own country. Okay, thank you. Peter, you had a question. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm very happy to hear that migration is considered not to be a problem but a fundamental resource for European society because that is, that is what we agree with. Um, of course, the problem is that the weight of, of migration is not always equally shared between different countries because, because migrants seek to enter the EU and they, they arrive in countries like Greece, Italy, and, and they have to carry the weight of, of that burden. 
But on 12th of June last year, the European Parliament has endorsed a common European asylum policy, and now we have to implement it. So my question to the candidates is, is everything now solved, now that we have this European <laughs> asylum policy? Do we need to do anything else, or is, um, okay, is everything set Okay, thank you. Scott. <laughs> is everything solved now we have it? No, nothing is solved, unfortunately. The only thing that we have now is something that is called a common European asylum system. But unfortunately, the system, it's not really common. It's not really asylum-oriented, and I'm not sure if you want to call it a system. So, at the moment, we still have a huge problem in, for instance, if people are coming from Syria, which is obviously a country in crisis where people have every reason to flee. But if you apply for asylum as a Syrian in Greece, you have no chance whatsoever of getting accepted. If you apply in Germany, you have a 96% chance of getting accepted. If you apply in Sweden, you will already get a res permanent residence service so, uh, permit. So there's huge amounts of differences. And um, what we have harmonized only are like really bad standards. So people can now be uh, put into jail for basically simply for apply because they applied for asylum and they don't carry papers or, or things like this. We have um, spread the worst. Um, examples. We have spread the worst practices and this is really a big problem. Yes, we need to help southern countries in coping better and yes, there should be a better sharing of the responsibility for migration uh, between the member states, but we should also have more solidarity with the migrants because nobody, except for us Greens, is looking at their needs and we may need to make sure that people, for instance, who speak French, why shouldn't they apply in France for asylum? Or people who have family in Sweden, why shouldn't they be allowed to apply in Sweden for asylum? It doesn't make sense to send them all across Europe and send them back and forth um, just to fulfill some uh, con like Dublin agreement, as it's called. Okay, so we so need to very much improve our asylum system. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Rebecca, someone asks, do you think that nations should be allowed to cap EU immigration if the national governments feel that they need to? So I did not understand the beginning uh, of the question. Uh, should countries in the EU be allowed to restrict in, uh, immigration within the EU if they think they need to? No, I think uh, free movement is one of the fundamental rights uh, in the European Union. We discussed it uh, again and again uh, during the last years, especially focused on Bulgaria and Romania. And uh, so I'm, I'm not at all of, uh, in favor of allowing single member states uh, to decide on their own. Um, remember Schengen, yeah? so if we give up on this, uh, then uh, Europe uh, will uh, develop into a mess. And uh, again, uh, so this uh, free movement is not uh, to the worst of uh, the single member states. Uh, for example, Germany, we had a, a tough discussion on Bulgaria and Romania again right now after uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, so Germany profited a lot from the free movement of citizens, especially from the east to the west during the last years. Uh, so we have many, many people who contributed to a good development in Germany, uh, but did not uh, get uh, the social security they should have got uh, because uh, their work was illegal. And uh, to the better for all the citizens, free movement and also free movement of workers is a fundamental need and a fundamental right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, Peter, you had a very nice question about Nigel Farage. Could you pose that to Monica? Well, I'd love to pose that question. Um, so, as already was mentioned, since uh, the 1st of January, Romanians and Bulgarians have been granted, finally, <laughs> their full rights as European citizens, and then they can now work in other European member states. But, uh, as we all know, people are often afraid of the unknown, and that's also the case in, in the case of migration. And especially in the UK, we saw that certain political parties are preying on that fear to, to grow their own basis of power. Uh, and of course, I'm, I'm talking about Nigel Farage here. So, my question is a very applied one. What would be your strategy to counter Nigel Farage if you would be debating directly with him? I know all the arguments, but how would you approach him in a debate face-to-face. -face. Yes, and how would you con convince the people who are afraid? Yeah, I think that, uh, that we have to confront uh, Nigel Farage uh, in a different way in which he participates to debates. 
and that is to uh, say uh, what actually happens and to face it with facts. As I was saying before, it is not true that we are living through uh, an influx. It is not true that uh, the, there is a very heavy weight on, uh, on social security systems. It is true that uh, there are big problems with some uh, uh, people uh, that uh, have to go away from their countries because they are treated badly. And so I think that one very serious way of dealing with the issue, issue probably not in the UK but in other countries, is to uh, face Romania and Bulgaria with the fact that they are not dealing with their own Roma population in a, in, a, in a fair way and they are not even using the EU money which is given to them to deal with it in, a, in, a, in an effective way. So I think that we have to be able to, to face Farage, which is, as I insist, is, is using false uh, um, arguments with true ones and not be afraid. And one thing we should really avoid to do, I believe, is to say they are bad, uh, they are anti-democratic, uh, they are, which actually they are. But uh, this is not the way in which we are going to convince people. We are going to convince people by destroying their false arguments. Okay, uh, Jose, you think this is enough to um, um, convince someone who might have lost his job as a trucker or a plumber uh, or a job like that? Well, if it's somebody from UK, they are looking very often on the other side of the Atlantic Sea. They are looking with the United States. And I would tell them a question quite easy. Is it possible to say that Californian peop people are not allowed to go to Texas or from people from Iowa not to go to Kentucky and so on? This is completely crazy. Europe is an open country and each time we are able to give work to somebody, the others, the growth of the European economy is going on better. So I think it's a crazy thing to say that people are not to go, allowed to go from a place to another. But what is true is that when the rules and the countries are trying to have lower rules from another countries to take the work, they break everything down. That's why we need really at the social level to build uh, a common uh, common rules to be sure that this, this doesn't happen. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this was the last thematic round. We would like to give all of you uh, two minutes, and I'm going to be quite strict about them, but two, you get two minutes for your last and final speech to convince people to vote for you in this green primary election. And uh, with only 23 hours left for people to vote, what do you have to say? Uh, I'm going to start with Ska. Thank you. I would like to encourage everybody to use those last 23 hours to vote in the Green primary because you're being part of a first time ever experiment to make Europe more democratic and to get as broad as possible an audience to actually vote on who's going to be the top two Green uh, candidates. And that matters a lot because in these European elections, the European citizens are going to decide on a lot of things. In which direction should Europe go? More democratic, less democratic. How are we going to deal with the banks? How are we getting out of the crisis? This is something that's going to be decided in May 2014. And this is where we Greens really need strong candidates all over Europe, but we also need strong European candidates to give a voice to the European dimension to go out in, and fight all over the European Union for a greener Europe to make sure what, to, to demonstrate what are the green choices, what are the green alternatives and how are you going to fight together for making Europe greener and better. And I would love to be that candidate to campaign all over the European Union, to go out to the member parties, to activists, to civil society organizations, to go out to the people. I'm bringing a lot of energy with me for that. I, I really enjoyed the primaries. It was a great example of how European debates can be organized, of how we can all work together. And I wish I can take this energy with me into the European election campaign. And I hope um, you make it possible and I'm really looking forward to uh, debating with Schulz, with Verhofstadt and whoever's going to be the, the EPP candidate because that's going to be um, big fun but also I think I can be a very good difference to those other three old guys. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jose. 
Well, uh, I think this was a, a very interesting experience. I am not <laughs> sure that we are building a new democracy with what we are doing, but I think it was a real challenge to try to open the decision of the Greens to choose the candidate. So we did it, and I think it's quite good to have d done it. But I'm not sure that this is the big revolution of democracy. I, we have to say this clearly, it's not a problem, but that's true. I hope now that this is not going to be the end of our European Commission, of our, our European uh, uh, pre, uh, campaign. This is the beginning of the campaign, and now we have to make a real campaign, really to make the difference with the other uh, uh, parties from all over Europe and not only in our own country. So this is a real challenge. For me, we have three topics. The first one, we need to explain to people how Europe can protect them from globalization, but also in their own life, to have a better life with better food, better agriculture, better best environment. This is one topic. The second is we have to explain to people how we can share our common values uh, for democracy and for human rights. This is really, for me, the, the middle of Europe. Why people, as Ukrainian people, want to come in Europe? Because they believe in the, our common values. And the third item I want to put on is that we have to create a new model, new economic model, new energetical model, new agriculture model, for example. I think this is possible if we are able really to make a good campaign. And I'm okay. sure with other European Greens will be able to do it. Thank you very much. Uh, Monica, what are you, you two minutes? And please unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself so we can hear you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Um, well, first of all, I must say that I really like to have this, uh, to do this primary. Certainly, this is not the major uh, European uh, democratic revolution, but I think that uh, we were able to show at least that it is possible to make a European campaign. It is not over, it is just at the beginning, uh, but there is uh, uh, one thing that all our listeners have to know, and that is that the next European election will be won by those who are able to mobilize their voters and those who are able to present the best and the more efficient uh, uh, proposals to change uh, the European Union that it is now. We have good ones. I think that the European um, Green New Deal, uh, the, uh, the issue of making the European Union not only a Euro uh, place or the place of the Troika, uh, but uh, a place uh, to protect uh, people is also very convincing. We need to make it real and I think that uh, I um, am somebody who can do that, actually, and uh, not only because I have a long experience in, uh, in this uh, European wide world, but uh, because I believe that uh, we have to stop building frontiers from the north, the south, the east, the west, and I believe that uh, our proposal has, has major strength, the fact that it's good for all Europeans and not only for some of them. And I believe that that is a big challenge and that is something that can be brought forward with uh, some um, convincing um, energy to do it. Okay, thank you very much. And finally, Rebecca. So I have uh, also to admit that uh, these uh, primaries have been uh, a, really an experiment um, and uh, also another experience among the Greens. Uh, I would like uh, to say thank you to my contenders and to the staff of the European Green Party uh, because everybody, also you as a moderator, uh, we uh, sometimes uh, had tough times with this uh, experiment and in this experience. I hope it will contribute to what I wish for the European campaign and also uh, to what I would like to contribute to this campaign. Um, so this idea of uh, bridging uh, the gaps in between East and West and North and South we started this already during uh, those uh, primaries. It, we can develop it uh, even better. I think uh, everybody understood uh, that uh, technology can help democracy, but is not the same uh, as uh, democracy. Um, my experience uh, right now in Kiev shows that one of my main ideas that green politicians have not only to have good ideas, but uh, have also to be 
always where the people are, this might help the campaign. So uh, vote people, we tried to convince you and uh, now 23 hours left, uh, it's, uh, it's high time to vote. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I have to say, I, have, I was there the first debate and the last debate. I have seen the four of you grow and really getting into campaign mode, but still I was really impressed that uh, despite all these campaign uh, things going on, you were still always focused on the content, and wherever we went in Europe, you always tried to do something uh, content-oriented and something with the local people as well. I, uh, I have to congratulate you with that. Um, are you nervous for the um, uh, uh, next Wednesday? There will be the uh, uh, the results will be published on a press conference. Are you nervous, Jose? Well, you know, it's not the first campaign I'm doing. I struggle a lot uh, on a lot of fights, and I think this was a so good moment that I don't. The problem, the both the two people who are going to be chosen for me it's going to be good. Even if I'm not inside, I think we made a good, we had a really good moment together and I think this was important. So for me this this experience I think is good and so for that uh, I, I'm waiting for Wednesday with no any problem. I think I'm going to sleep very well. Okay, uh, Ska, if you don't get to debate uh, Schulz and you don't get to debate for Hofstadt, how are you, what are you going to do during the campaign instead? Well, I'll in any case um, make a huge election campaign um, and uh, of course we want to get as many Greens into the European Parliament as we can because it will really depend on whether we have a progressive Green force in there. That will make a huge difference. So whether I'm debating Schulz or not, I mean I can still debate him then just of uh, the TV cameras, no problem, no difference. It's still going to be a great election campaign. Okay, um, Monica, and if if you if you become this, in which country would you like to campaign the most? Um, I must say that I was thinking at the beginning that I would have been limited myself only to some countries, whereas I really enjoyed not doing it. So I will not answer your question, and I think that uh, uh, there there is uh, there are going to be. Uh, in case this, uh, the result is positive, many countries in which we will have to, do, to go. But I believe that uh, the European Green Party has uh, a lot of things and proposals to present also for the candidates, which for the contenders who will not win. So I think that uh, um, there will be a lot of, uh, of work to do. And I believe, as Jose said, uh, that uh, anybody winning uh, is going to be uh, a good candidate. I also want to thank all my co-contenders and the team because I enjoyed this. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Rebecca, uh, aren't you somewhere hoping you don't win this so you have more time to go to Ukraine? <laughs> so you you can read uh, maybe the minds of my friends in Maidan because so on the one hand they want me to win the primaries uh, because I help them a lot uh, in Brussels but on the one on the other hand they said uh, don't uh, don't be excited on this if you fail you can start another campaign in Ukraine. So we will see you. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that sounds good. Uh, I want to thank the four of you for uh, the, the nice time we had. And I wish you the best of luck the coming two days uh, with your fingers crossed. And uh, we're going to see on Wednesday uh, which two of you will have one. I also uh, want to thank Peter and Miguel uh, from Jeff and AJ for the question they have been posing. And I want to thank you as viewers for watching this online primary debate. If you still want to cast your vote, you can for the next 22 hours and 45 minutes on www.greenprimary.eu um, and on Wednesday we will announce the winners on every possible platform. Thank you for watching and good night. Bye bye.